So good morning and thank uh, all of you and welcome to our fourth annual Civic Day sponsored by Center for Inquiry Indiana and the Indianapolis chapter of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. It's easy to get depressed after an election such as we just had when it seems that the religious right is controlling everything from the national to the state, especially in states like Indiana. However, great strides were made in Indiana in 2014 toward social justice. CFI, AU, and our cultural allies, many of whom are tabling here today, Freedom Indiana, Planned Parenthood of Indiana, Kentucky, and the American Civil Liberties Union of Indiana have stood up for justice and won some important battles in the last year. In July of 2014, Center for Inquiry, represented in court by ACLU of Indiana, won an important victory in the Seventh Circuit for the rights of non-religious. So CFI secular settlements were approved to solemnize marriages in Indiana. This decision has further implications beyond who can solemnize marriages in Indiana. Is a victory for equal treatment of non-religious in other matters where religions are privileged over non-religion. We at CMI want to thank Ken Falk, legal director of ACLU of Indiana, and a top civil liberties attorney in ACLU of Indiana for representing us in that case. It would not have been possible without them. For information about our Sacred Solomon program, uh, which allows us to solemnize marriages in Indiana, and we also do funerals and memorials and some other ceremonies that don't really require legal sanction, but the marriages do. We have information at our CFI information table here today. We have an awesome lineup of Indiana movers and shakers on our crew today. Megan Robertson, who was a campaign manager for Freedom Indiana, which was a large coalition of business, industry, educational institutions, and other organizations, which successfully kept the anti-same-sex marriage amendment off the ballot in 2014. That was a big victory. Jane Henniger, and I'm saying Jane Henniger, but I think it's going to be Kate Blair instead of Jane Henniger, representing ACLU today because Jane's husband had to have an emergency surgery. So she's with him at the hospital. But anyway, I think Kate is representing, but anyway. Um, ACLU uh, represented some of the couples in the same-sex marriage case, which resulted in same-sex marriage becoming legal in Indiana. As a result of that decision, and the decision making to see if I say herself was legal to solemnize marriages in Indiana, I solemnized the first same-sex marriage solemnized by CFI Secular Celebrant in Indiana on October the 15th when CFI member Terry Yoder, who's here today, is Terry there, he was running there in the morning, okay, and his partner of 35 years, John Combs, became married couple. With the ceremony taking place on the beautiful downtown Canal, Canal Wall outside of CFI Indiana. Betty Conkrum is one of our speakers. She is the CEO of Planned Parenthood of Indiana, Kentucky. She had been CEO of Indiana for several years, and then the two states merged, so she was the CEO of both. She's been advocating for women's health and fighting to keep abortion legal, safe, and rare for many years. ACW of Indiana also won important cases for Planned Parenthood and women's rights in Indiana. Now, just some housekeeping remarks. We're running on a tight schedule today. If you ordered a lunch and have not picked it up, please do. There will not be a lunch break, so please eat your lunch discreetly during the program. The letter code on the bottom right-hand corner of your name tag denotes the kind of sandwich you ordered in your lunch. The beverages on the table are free to everyone, as are the snack bars. Particularly if you didn't order lunch, or if you did, and you had hungry, there's two snack bars back to the van. Restrooms are available behind me. Women's over here, and men's over here. Due to the limited amount of time here at the State House, there will be no question and answer after any of the speeches. 
You're all invited to the reception at CFI Indiana meeting after the program. There will be barbecue sandwiches and lots of other good goodies and beverages for you there. That's a good time to interact with some of the speakers. Not all of them may be there, but some of the speakers will be there. And other people who are attending the program today. If you did not register for the reception, you are welcome to come. There's plenty of food over there, so don't worry about that. So now we'll get on to introducing our first speaker of the day, who is Ron Lindsay, who is the CEO of Center for Inquiry at the transnational level. Uh, he's an honor graduate from the University of Virginia School of Law. He practiced for 26 years with the national law firm of C. Carr Shaw LLP prior to joining the Center for Inquiry where he has been president and CEO since June of 2008. He received his PhD from Georgetown University, specializing in bioethics. And tomorrow night, in addition to his speech here today, tomorrow night he will be discussing his new book called The Necessity of Secularism, Why God Can't Tell Us What to Do. And that will be tomorrow night at 6 p.m. at Center Inquiry in the afternoon. Thank you, Reva, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, today I'm going to take you back in time. Yes, take you back to the Middle Ages, as it were. Because I'm not going to have a PowerPoint. Yeah, it's just me talking here. Uh, so I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible. You just have to be back in the pictures of your favorite PowerPoint. At any rate, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Decisions for ourselves about what we want to read, what we want to do. 
So when someone uh, deprives us of these freedoms, in effect what they're doing is taking over or appropriating part of our life. They're trying to dictate and direct how critical aspects of our life should be lived, and that's just wrong. That's why I say, I believe human dignity requires the right of everyone to decide for themselves what to believe about religion, what to believe about God or God or what have you. Everyone should be okay to come to their own conclusion about uh, religious matters without any kind of oversight, compulsion, or prodding by the state. But it's not just a matter of respecting human dignity. And I think freedom of conscience, along with some other fundamental freedoms, has instrumental value as well, in order to serve certain utilitarian purposes. If you think about history for a moment, uh, freedom of conscience, again, along with other fundamental freedoms, has been a great engine of social change. It's certainly no coincidence that it was after the Enlightenment, that is after we first began to recognize the importance of freedom of conscience, and think about the separation of church and state, that we began to push for democratic governments, for republican forms of government. Because, again, until the United States was founded, most Western nations were what? They were monarchies. They were ruled by kings or queens. And you will call from their history the justification, such as it was, for that form of government was the so-called divine right. Once people got a freedom of conscience and began to think about religious matters for themselves, once we got rid of established churches, it became a little harder to maintain this fiction that God had somehow selected some persons who were over us. So, as I said, uh, freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, these other freedoms, they had a kind of snowball effect. Uh, they give people the ability to think for themselves, to engage in critical thinking, and that has led to about other institutions and practices. And overall, it's been a very good thing. Finally, freedom of conscience, if exercised appropriately, is a great benefit to the individual and really imposes no cost on anyone else. Here, Thomas Jefferson put that right, uh, as he did on many other things, on another observation he had, and that he said, you know, it does me no injury if my neighbor believes in 20 gods. Or no one. It either hits my pocket or breaks my leg. And that's absolutely true. It doesn't really make any difference to us what someone believes about God or their gods, or, and it also doesn't make any difference to us you know, when they express their beliefs, their entitled to their opinions. Likewise, private religious practices usually don't have any adverse to that on others. Someone doesn't want to eat pork. So what? I don't care about that, right? Someone doesn't want to drink alcohol? For me, right? I don't care. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, someone wants to grow a beard? Oh, I don't have an objection to that, obviously. Someone doesn't want to grow a beard. Wants to go completely hairless. Again, that's their, that's their right, that's their opinion. They want to wear an orange robe, a pink robe, a brown robe. All those things are matters of personal religious belief and personal religious practice. And you know, I may think they're silly or unfounded. Most people think other people's religious beliefs are silly or unfounded to some extent. But so what? It's their right to decide what they want to do about their religious beliefs and how to practice their beliefs. And we really have no justification for interfering with someone's private religious practices. I think what I've kind of outlined so far represents the kind of consensus that has prevailed in the United States, at least until recently, about freedom of conscience. In other words, I think most people accept that, yeah, yeah, this is a good thing, and that fact, people have the right to hold whatever beliefs they want, and to express those beliefs, and also have the right to their private religious practices, provided, and this is a big proviso, this is where the battle lines are being drawn now, provided, that their practices don't impinge on others. But what's happened in the last couple of decades is there's been now a concerted, determined effort to expand the meaning, the scope of religious liberty or religious freedom. 
Many are no longer satisfied with just this idea that, oh yeah, you can do what you want, you can express what you believe, you can have your private practices provided that they don't affect others. Instead, many are asserting a very expansive understanding of the religious liberty that says, in fact, they can exercise their beliefs even when they may, in fact, cause the world cause others. Specifically, they're asking to be exempt from the general laws uh, that apply to everyone on religious grounds. And I say they're making this assertion even in situations where it's clear that assertion of this right will cause some hurt on others. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is a distortion of the meaning of religious liberty. It's a very expansive understanding of religious liberty. I think it stretches the concept of you know, any uh, justifiable violence. The vehicle for doing this, by the way, uh, the vehicle for asserting these claims, is not typically the United States Constitution. I hope you're not saying it's, it's a requirement of the free exercise clause. Nor is it typically uh, the state constitutions that they're using to assert these rights. Rather, it's a statutory law. And in particular, three types of statutes. One, we have the Federal uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Then we have states that have their own versions of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, often called mini reckless, that mimic, in some cases, actually more expansive than the federal law. And then we have a number of specialized statutes, if you will, called specialized to address certain situations. These are statutes that give exemptions to certain classes of workers. Uh, typically, healthcare workers uh, saying that in fact, uh, if they have some kind of religious exemption, uh, objection, they don't have to provide certain services. The most obvious example, one that's been litigated the most, the subject of this discussion, is an exemption for pharmacists who don't want to dispense birth control medication. Some states have legislation on the books that provides that exemption. Indiana, a couple of years ago, there was a bill introduced, I think, in 2015 break that exemption, uh, however, it was defeated, I think, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was defeated, I think, in the House, uh, after it was introduced in the Senate. So anyway, we have these uh, different statutory claims now, uh, and especially the last few years have been pressed vigorously. Uh, so is there any justification for this? Any justification for this expansive interpretation of religious liberty? A moment ago I said my view is that this represents, that it represents a distortion of religious liberty for freedom of conscience. It's an expansive beyond its previously understood borders. But there's been some pushback on that type of argument. I know certainly I would see this pushback sometimes when I talk about this issue. But some people have said, I'm just incorrect. I'm incorrect when I say that this expansive understanding of religious liberty represents a distortion. Because they'll say, you're wrong. In fact, historically, we have recognized exemptions from certain obligations based on religious grounds, and we have done so even in situations where that exemption causes a burden some kind of uh, greater burden on others. And what's the example they cite? It is something that uh, historically has been around, been around actually since the beginning of this country. It's an exemption that grants to certain individuals from military service, or to be more precise, combat service. In other words, conscientious objectors to combat service have historically been granted an exemption. Uh, at first, actually, it was something that went at the state level, because you may recall from the history, we didn't have much of the National Army. And until the Civil War, uh, we didn't have a draft. Uh, it was volunteer service only. But a number of state militias did have compulsory service, and a number of states in the 1800s, when they had to address this issue, decided to grant exemption from combat service, uh, typically to Quakers, the members of the Friends Society, because that was the biggest pastors. Time. But once the federal government got the business of instituting the draft, and again that started the Civil War, 
contained others in the rule of law, World War II, etc., the federal government decided to recognize this exemption as well. And in fact, there's a rule of law passed that said if you had a conscientious objection to serving in combat, you don't have to do that. And the argument that some people have is, well, that certainly created a number of numbers because if you're not serving in combat, that means someone else is going to have to take your place. And you know, serving in combat, not the easiest thing in the world to do, it's supposed to be some risk, right? So what about that argument? Does that provide a precedent for the type of exemptions that some people are trying to claim today? Does it provide an exemption, for example, a precedent for the exemption that pharmacists are trying to get? In other words, they, they want to be able to hold their jobs and yet refuse to dispense certain types of medication. Well, I don't think it does provide a precedent. And I think if you analyze the case of conscientious objective from combat service, you'll see the factors that are in play there, the criteria that we have used, don't apply to the types of exemptions that people are trying to get today. Because first of all, how did this conflict come about? Again, it's a conflict between the conscience of the individual and the obligation to serve. Well, it's a conflict that's created by the government. Right? Because the government has a draft. It's compelling people to serve in the military. So it's not as though someone volunteered for military service and then started to fiddle about the duties of their son. Another factor that weighs in favor of granting conscientious objective status in the case of the pacifist conscript is that this person is willing, or is willing, and the government tells us to condition the benefit exemption, willing to accept some burden in lieu of combat service. And this factor is important because it can balance out the harm that the person may be causing by refusing to engage in combat. Because typically what the government has done is to say, well, if you object to combat service, it doesn't mean you just get off scot free, right? You go home and whatever. No. You have to provide some sort of alternative service. Uh, and, you know, depending on the war we were in, and, you know, the way the government has handled this, it has changed over time. But basically, uh, if you want to do it, you become a medic. Many of our medics are actually veterans of combat service. Or you provide, in World War II, we had labor service outside the military. So you can work on the roads and what have you for a period of years. Point being, though, that we were simply more than just let off. We had to provide some sort of alternative service, uh, which kind of made up to the burden you might be imposing on others, because you were taking on work and taking on work that otherwise would not have been done. Also, obviously, the purpose of making sure that your objection was sincere, right? That you were actually objecting to combat, you weren't simply trying to get off of any sort of service. Then, of course, there's an important pragmatic consideration, and that's this. There's actually no point in forcing someone to you know, bear a rifle if they're not going to use it. In fact, forcing a pacifist into a foxhole with other people in the service actually creates more of a burden on those other service people because it exposes them to greater danger. I mean, the last person you want with you in combat is someone who's not going to use their weapon, who isn't going to provide any assistance. So exempting that person from combat actually alleviates the burden. Again, you don't want someone with you on the front line who's not going to give any assistance to you. And you know, the cost of dealing with pacifists otherwise, with the alternative being putting them in prison, that doesn't really make any sense because that just generates greater costs for us and we don't get any benefit from it. So I think based on those four foregoing factors, the criteria that I've outlined, we can make the judgment that allowing certain individuals to be exempt from combat service on grounds of conscientious objection is justified. But that does not mean we have to have an expansive interpretation of freedom of conscience that would allow people in other professions from being relieved from fulfilling their duties. Again, it doesn't mean that we have to allow the pharmacist for people to say, hey, I don't want to smoke that, that medication. Well, why is that? Well, let's look at the factors that apply to the military case again and generalize those factors. Again, first, in the military situation, 
the conflict between conscience and the requirement to take certain action is created by the government. Second, in the military situation, the conscientious objector is willing to accept sunburn as the price of exercising their conscience. Third, in the military situation, the exemption can be narrowly tailored so that the objector's refusal to serve in the military or in combat doesn't obstruct the decisions of others. And finally, as I said, there's overwhelming compelling reasons, pragmatic reasons, why you don't want to force a pacifist uh, into a situation where they're carrying a weapon or fulfilling some sort of combat role. So I think under those circumstances, there is a reasonable basis for saying someone could have an exemption from certain obligations based on religious grounds. But applying this criteria to other situations shows that in fact exemptions are not warranted. Again, let's take the situation we talked about already, the so to the situation with pharmacists who refuses to dispense some forms of contraception because it violates uh, his or her beliefs. Well, pharmacists are often employees of the drugstore, right? The person you know, who go there for the prescription. So the issue really is, should they be able, should they be able to retain their jobs without you know, undergoing any sort of discipline, while at the same time picking and choosing which prescriptions they want to choose? Because essentially that's what they're asking for. They're asking for the right to refuse to perform certain duties without incurring any penalty to themselves. I don't think so. Again, to begin, in the military situation, the government is compelling someone to serve. That's the other whole purpose of the drug. It's not a question of someone volunteering and refusing to perform service. But no one is forced to become a pharmacist. No one's forced to become a nurse. No one's forced to become any sort of healthcare worker or to take on any job where there may be some sort of conflict between their religious obligations and their duties. So unlike the conscriptive pacifist, these individuals have chosen to place themselves in a situation where they may be required to provide services to which they object. So unless and until the government actually legally, legally requires people to become pharmacists, those professionals are in a completely different situation from the conscientious objector to combat service. Moreover, the state has granted pharmacists monopolistic privileges over the services they provide. If you're not a pharmacist, you can't dispense medication. We can't get medication, right? But the government has decided it needs to be dispensed by a pharmacist. So effectively, you know, people in this country can't obtain certain types of medication without the cooperation of cooperation of pharmacists. So effectively, these conscientious pharmacists want to exercise control over our access to health care and deny us the health care when you know, that we deem appropriate. And no one is forcing the pharmacists themselves to take contraception. What pharmacists are trying to do, at least some pharmacists are trying to do, is decide what medication we can have. And I think that just doesn't just make any sense. You know, allowing the pharmacists to have exclusive control over critical aspects of our health care while simultaneously retaining the right to deny these services from time to time based on their religious beliefs, that's analogous to allowing critical military command decisions to be staffed by pacifists and then letting them decide at the discretion whether or not certain units are going to be deployed for combat, right? makes no sense whatsoever. What's really happening here is this alleged right to religious liberty is actually an alleged right to adversely affect the decisions of others who don't share the person's religious beliefs. So as I said, I don't think that the, the historical exemption we recognize in the military situation has any application and doesn't provide any precedent for these expansive exemptions that people are pushing for nowadays. But the reality is, something we have to face, whether or not this expansive understanding of religious liberty and freedom of
conscious makes any sense. It's something that may be leading into your question. And I have to say, I think the situation objectively, the momentum is now in favor of those who want an expansive understanding of religious liberty. <laughs> Let's take a moment now to kind of review the legal landscape and figure out you know, how we got the situation. Back in 1993, the United States Congress passed what's called the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act. Essentially, it was an emotional response to a Supreme Court decision, uh, Employment Division versus Smith, which many people thought was wrongly decided, but widespread criticism. In that decision, uh, the state of Oregon decided to deny unemployment benefits to some Native Americans who used peyote as part of their tribal uh, religious ceremonies. Uh, and because they used peyote, they tested positive for messaging. Uh, now, there was substantial outrage over this decision because it seemed that in fact these individuals were being denied important benefits on employment benefits for engaging in an act that really realistically didn't affect employment. It is true that peyote was a controlled substance, but everyone agreed that it used in small amounts and the amounts that are used in these tribal ceremonies, it really didn't have the adverse effect on other people. Uh, let's say kind of a small grain hallucinogen. So as I said, there was a lot of outrage in this decision. It seemed to be unfair to these people in this situation. So the, there was this groundswell support to uh, pass this legislation. And what the Religious Freedom Restoration Act provides is that the government may not substantially burden a person's exercise of religion unless the government's action serves a compelling government interest and the government has chosen the least restrictive means to further that interest. Now, first, after the uh, referendum, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was passed, it wasn't exactly clear that it was going to work a revolution in our understanding of religious liberty. Uh, because after all, actually, first of all, a lot of people just said it all did was really a state test that was used in three exercise cases before the employment decision, employment division versus Smith case. Furthermore, within a couple of years after the passage of RIFRA, the Supreme Court narrowed the scope considerably. Uh, there's a case that we learned versus Flores in which the Supreme Court decided that RIFRA would apply only to the federal government. In other words, it would not apply to legislation or regulations passed by the states. So obviously that narrow the range of cases to which you apply. Now a number of states after that decision, after the Flores decision, did pass their own version of RIFRA, so called mini RIFRAs. But frankly, uh, they were used in a few cases, but to a large extent they were kind of ignored. They weren't books, they weren't utilized at all. What's happened, just in the last few years in particular, is that interest in the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, both at the federal and the state level, has increased significantly. And it really started with this fight over the Obama administration's contraceptive mandate, which as you well know now, as you know, it provided that employers with health insurance plans had to include contraceptive coverage within the scope of those plans. While a number of employers including corporate employers, maintain that having employees covered by their health plan who might make use of contraception would violate their religious liberty, would violate their freedom of conscience. Now think about that for a moment. What essentially these employees were claiming was that actions taken by others, actions taken by third parties, create a burden on their religious liberty. I mean, because this was so, you know, the Obama administration actually kind of prevent this type of argument in these situations where they realize there might be some employers that object to this. What they did was, they would say, well, you actually don't have to arrange for coverage yourself. Your insurer can make all the arrangements for the coverage, so you know, basically your hands are clean. You're not involved in arranging the contraceptive coverage for employees. That's all going to be taken care of by a third party. Nonetheless, a number of employers said, and again, this included corporations, 
can't do it. Do what we can't do. It violates our religious principles. Well, I think all of you know by now what happened. Uh, this is the Hobby Lobby decision that was decided last year. And by a 5 to 4 majority, the Supreme Court decided, well, first of all, they decided that corporations are persons under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Something that many people thought was strange because I've never seen corporations in the or corporations in sacraments or anything else. But well, nonetheless, of course, decided that, yes, they have religious rights under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Furthermore, they decided that, in fact, having employees decide to use contraception under the employer's health care plan, even though the employer itself did not have any, didn't have anything to do with arranging for the coverage, that somehow violated that employer's freedom of conscience. It burdened their religion. The argument, by the way, was that somehow, just by having them come in there, facilitating this moral decision by these employees to get contraception. Furthermore, the court found that, well, it created a burden. You know, because one of the government's arguments was, look, if these employees had voluntarily decided to have a health insurance plan, there's no requirement under federal law to have a health insurance plan. Even with the Affordable Care Act, there's no requirement for the employer to have a plan. You may have to pay a tax penalty now, but there's no requirement to have a plan. Well, the court said, look, that's going to be a burden because none of the things in place the employer to be prepared to disadvantage. The court didn't really address so much that there was a compelling interest here. The government maintained, the Obama administration maintained, there was a compelling interest because we want to make sure that we have access to contraception, that's an important health care issue. The Supreme Court kind of passed it over, but they said, in any event, the government doesn't use the least restrictive means. Because they can arrange, and they can make sure that employees have access to contraception. How? Well, the government can pay for the coverage itself. There's a way to get that coverage to uh, workers who want contraception. Don't impose a burden on the employer. Have the government pick up the cost. Well, for a lot of different reasons, and we can talk probably at length about Bobby Bobby. Bad decision. But what it has done, one of its bad effects, I think, it has breathed life into this push to have an expansive understanding of the boundaries of religious freedom, of freedom of conscience. It's really opened up a whole Pandora's box, if you will. And now there's a push in a number of states, I think there are six, maybe seven states now, that either are passed or introduced legislation to have, have their own mini FR reference, religious freedom restoration acts. Indiana, by the way, is one of those states. The bill introduced, I think, in the Senate, and I get corrected, just recently, or Indiana has adopted its own uh, religious freedom restoration act. And there's been a renewed push to have specialized legislation exempting various workers, healthcare workers, and various sorts, nurses, pharmacists, whatever, to be relieved of various duties. Uh, and one of the problems here is that this is really untested territory. We don't really know how far these exemptions are going to be pushed. Uh, one, uh, obviously, one thing that's been talked about quite a bit is that perhaps some workers, some employers are going to say that if there is a situation, a state where, in fact, there's a law prohibiting discrimination against uh, LGBT individuals, they don't have to pay that law because they have a moral objection, a religious objection to, for example, providing services, uh, especially if it relates to same-sex marriage, services to, to gay customers. Uh, we don't know how that's going to turn out. It's, again, a relatively untested error. Now, the Supreme Court in the Hobby Lobby case did say that ending racial discrimination is a compelling government of interest. So you couldn't use a religious objection to get out of uh, giving people treatment to people based on race. Then specifically address the LGBT issue. And certainly, if you were in a state that did not have a law that prohibited discrimination against lesbians or gays, I think you might be able to make an argument that it doesn't serve a compelling government interest uh, to prevent discrimination against lesbians or gays because you know, our state doesn't adopt that legislation. 
point is, I mean, there are a lot of different ways uh, this extension is used. I'll just mention a couple that have come up. Uh, there are people in Kansas, there's a lawsuit pending right now in Kansas, arguing that the state standards for education, which indicate that evolution is being taught in Kansas schools, that's the new Kansas thinks that evolution should be taught in schools. Very watered down evolution, but nonetheless, should be taught. That this hinges on their religious beliefs, it creates a burden on their religious beliefs, and the government needs to provide a less restrictive alternative to fulfill uh, this role. Uh, one case that came up recently was on this morning. A nurse applied for a job at a family planning clinic. It wasn't just any health care job, it was actually a family planning clinic. But she told, and she informed the employer when she applied, that was actually an objection to dispensing birth control language. So she was turned down for the job. She sued. But I mean, she was unlikely turned down for a job because that requirement imposed a burden, an unjustifiable burden, on her religious beliefs. And finally, I'll mention a case I was familiar with. It had to do with a book I actually wrote a few years ago on bioethical issues. Because this law is an issue that touches on bioethics, the question of health care exemptions for certain people. There's a case that came up in, in Minnesota a few years ago. Minnesota, by the way, does not have if it did, this case might have decided differently. But there were a number of cab drivers at the uh, Minneapolis airport that were refusing to take certain passengers. On what ground? Well, these have to be Muslim cab drivers, and they would ask their passengers uh, when they were getting in the cab, are you carrying any alcohol with you? <coughs> and if you're carrying alcohol with you, the cab driver said, you're going to find someone else. Right? I'm not going to carry a passenger that has alcohol with them. Well, that led to hearings before the Minneapolis City Council, the Taxi Cab Commission, whatever. At the end of the day, Minneapolis decided, hey, no, if you want to drive a cab, we have to provide services to everyone. Would that have been decided differently if Minneapolis or Minnesota had a religious freedom restoration act? I think it might well be decided differently because you can see the argument they made put it on the cab drivers and the religious beliefs. Uh, compelling government interest here. Well, what is the compelling government interest? Yeah, you want to make sure people get cabs, but presumably, just forcing all cab drivers, including Muslims, to take any passenger isn't the least restrictive alternative. You could have some kind of system set up where, you know, Passengers would have to wait for you know, five or ten minutes for a cab. How's that burden compared to the burden being imposed on the Muslim who was just offended by the presence of alcohol in their cab? I don't know. Interesting question. I think it would be a horrible decision if we recognize the right of people to refuse to provide all their services based on their views. But that may be the result. So this is something we have to look at. It's a big push right now. Pushing out of Indiana and big push in other states to expand the boundaries of freedom of conscience and religious liberty, as I say, I think is a distortion of religious freedom. And I'll close very quickly. I know the theme of this conference is justice, how to advance justice. I think an indispensable part of advancing justice is having freedom. And as I said, freedom of conscience is a fundamental freedom. It's a very important freedom for everyone. And you cannot have just society if you deprive people of freedom of conscience. But at the same time, we have to recognize the limits to that freedom. You know, a lot of people have, there's been a lot of debate throughout history, how you define justice. Ongoing debate. Uh, Aristotle defined justice as giving people their due. I mean, a pretty open-ended definition. Uh, it's a very general definition that has to be filled in. I think it's fair to say that in the context of the Buddhist liberty, freedom of conscience, giving people their due means, yes, we should respect absolutely the right of someone to hold beliefs, to express beliefs, and to practice their beliefs, provided they don't depend on the rights of others. But we need to draw a firm line around that freedom and make sure that we don't allow this liberty to be so 
So in effect, what it is doing is to cause the other people, their freedom, to make important decisions about their lives. Thank you.